G'day all, my name's Pete Morrison. I'm the co-CEO of Bohemian Interactive Simulations and thank you uh, for coming to the military user group this year. We do this every six months at iTech and iTSEC. It's uh, turning into more of a VBS information session uh, and I think that's okay. Uh, towards the end of my brief, I'll talk about uh, our initiative to restart the actual military user group and have it shared by uh, someone in the military rather than Bohemia pushing it along. Uh, VBS has turned into a very complex product where, I'll talk about this, but doing over 40 uh, development projects right now. Uh, and uh, we have multiple baselines uh, serving enterprise customers all over the world. So it's more important than ever that military users of VBS get together and talk about what they're contracting, uh, what the roadmap is, make sure that BISIM doesn't get paid twice for anything. Uh, I think all of this is very important. So what we're going to do today, uh, I'm going to brief on the current status of VBS. I'm going to talk about our 2015 roadmap. Like I said, there's 40 projects we're working on, so I can't go into too much detail in the time that I have. Uh, I'll be giving you a bit of a demonstration of one of our new products. I'll be handing over to Paul uh, from NATO ACT, who is going to give you a brief on VBS NATO. I'll be talking about TerraSim and some of the work they've been doing with TerraTools and some of their new products, and then we'll wrap up. So that's the plan for today. The idea is to keep it informal. Uh, if you have any questions, just speak up. Uh, if I'm talking too quickly, just throw something at me. Uh, it really, I've got a lot of people here from BI Sim who I'll introduce in a moment. This is your opportunity to ask the developers questions. Uh, we've got Mark, our CTO. Mark, just stand up, please. Mark, of course, has been with the company for many years. Um, basically, everything in VBS is his fault. And uh, he can answer your technical questions. I've got Earl here, who's currently from TerraSim, at TerraSim. So you might know Earl was uh, previously one of our directors within BISIM. He's now moved across to Pittsburgh. I'd like to introduce you to Rusmat, Rusmat Ahmed, who's just joined us. He's taking over as head of sales for EMEA from me. Uh, I personally am going to be focusing more on my chief product officer role. So I'm the guy that is formulating the roadmap. Uh, I'm the guy that's going to come and ask you for your feedback, what can be changed. I manage all of the internal projects for BISIM. So there's a CCB process, uh, I'll talk to that. And there's a big long list of improvements that I've prioritized uh, that go into the CCB for development in the next iteration. Uh, we've never had that, uh, that before, and so I'm very excited to be getting out of sales and getting closer back to the product. And Rusmat's taking over from me. Uh, Eva, I'll introduce you in a minute. The other person we have up the front here is Ollie. He's working in product management with me. So that's the agenda for my brief. I'll, I'll give you an update. I'll talk about some of our projects, look at some key enhancements, talk about two new products, and then I'll quick look at the roadmap. So an intro to BISIM, we're now at about 220 staff. Uh, we've grown, uh, we've almost tripled in size over the last two and a half years. The main reason being that we were acquired by a private equity firm uh, called Riverside. And they've been fantastic owners. Uh, they've really invested in BISIM and uh, allowed us to do internal projects. I actually have IR&D money now that I can spend on making these products better. And uh, I think you're going to see the, the fruits of the, that labor. We are not a systems integrator. So we don't want to do anything that involves hardware. We focus on the software. We build VBS as a platform. And that's a platform that you can then use and give to your contractors uh, to make better or tailor for your needs. So that's very important. We are not a systems integrator. We don't want to annoy any of those systems integrators that are down there on the show floor. You know, we, we, we try to encourage them to use VBS uh, almost like an operating system. It's, it's a platform. And we're making it more and more open as time goes by. The military user group uh, shares non-export controlled VBS3 development. The Snow technology that the Swedes have recently paid for is in the 3.6 build that everybody receives. And this is an important part of our, uh, of our model. The exception, of course, we reserve the right to create new products. Uh, and that's where a lot of our IR&D money goes in. And uh, so yes, unfortunately, you will need to buy some things from us every now and then, uh, as I'm sure you would uh, appreciate. And finally, we value our independence in this market. So we're not exclusively aligned with any systems integrator. Uh, we'll offer VBS to anyone for any project. Uh, we may choose to team with a prime for a specific development contract, uh, of course, but in general we try to be completely neutral and not close down VBS in, in, in any way. Uh, and that's what I mean by staying neutral in this, uh, in this market. We now have seven offices. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with where they are. The most recent one is our German office, which uh, is based out of Frankfurt. Uh, you may have seen the press release, but Germany is essentially our newest enterprise license holder. 
They haven't bought a traditional enterprise license. It's more of a standing offer to buy licenses over the next three years. I think the initial buy was 300 licenses. So we're very happy to have uh, opened up our German office and uh, be supporting the Bundeswehr. Our teams internationally have grown rapidly due to significant riverside investment. So our owners have been reinvesting back into our company. Uh, US Army GFT and CCT, the US Army and US Marine Corps are driving about 70% of our revenue. So more now than ever, uh, the US military is driving the VBS roadmap. Uh, but we're seeing a, a significant uptake in, in Europe. Uh, and we are therefore ramping up both program management and QA teams internationally. What this means for you is, is more stable builds. Uh, we have heard that VBS 3.4 is the most stable build ever. Uh, and if you were there in the dark days of VBS 1.12, I think you'll appreciate that. We can now do a faster turnaround of development work. So uh, I'll, I'll talk to that. You get more free stuff for your support money because uh, we're putting more capability than ever before into the baseline. And of course, we're creating additional VBS based products. And, and the little graph in the bottom right just shows our growth. And I'm telling you this because I want you to appreciate that VI Sim is no longer that small company in the shed in Australia, as fun as that was. We've really grown into a, a simulation developer over the last couple of years. I'm going to ask Eva to stand up now. So Eva is our Director of uh, Global Programs. And so she's been leading the change within VI Sim as we've become a more professional organisation. And she's going to talk now to two slides. All right. So as Pete mentioned, our big changes are focusing in on program management and QA. Part of that is actually establishing a program management office. This is led out of the Orlando office. Um, this is where we are standardizing our project management. We're uh, customer focused on uh, project monitoring, controlling, and reporting our project management resources. So you have a structure that has, uh, you know, my position, the VP of Global Programs, with directors, program managers, and project managers that support all uh, different level and. Uh, of, of programs and projects that we are taking on across the enterprise. So this, um, all this information, the best practices are actually coming from a centralized location to better serve our customer need. Uh, we can resource plan better, resource manage better, and actually um, make those resources available to all the customers and have an understanding of the programs that are going on. So if there's any collaborations that need to happen, any um, any feedback that we are receiving across multiple customers, it is a centralized office to manage that. Okay, so big change. To support this, we also have, uh, we centralize our contracts as well. So one of the supporting functions of the PMO office. And this is just, there's five focus areas to um, contracts management as well. We have, again, mission focused, contracts uh, administration focused, teamwork and collaboration, ethics and risk management. Once you have that, we also know we can help our customers in uh, the actual contracts process, uh, adhering to contracts, uh, any legal matters is centralized. It's a little different, a change, but um, actually a benefit to, uh, to all of you, hopefully. So any questions on uh, the program side, the contract side, please feel free to contact me, talk to me about that. Thank you. Cool, cool. Thank you very much. And finally, with regards to quality assurance, so we've greatly staffed up our QA teams as well over the last couple of years. Uh, there are some metrics up here which I'll, I'll read to you. For 3.4, the QA team caught 1,189 bugs. Uh, and then down through to 3.6, we were down to 483 bugs. So this is a QA team that's highly effective. And that's what's driving the stability in these most recent versions of VBS. Uh, 3.6, of course, was released just a couple of days ago. Uh, I heard a disturbing rumor from the Dutch that 3.6 had some, some big errors. This is not the case. Uh, with Windows 7, it works fine. There are some issues with uh, Windows 8. So um, I guess you're half right. Uh, we're going to be re releasing a hotfix fairly shortly for that. Uh, but if you're using Windows 7, 3.6 is, is good to go. Uh, here I am trying to be honest. OK, so uh, in 2015, we're also investing in our build and distribution system. So we have many baselines of VBS now. We're trying some new things. Uh, we're doing a lot of hot fixing. Uh, we recognize that the Dutch and the Swedes, for example, 
uh, once they test a baseline, that's what they want to roll out. So we might complete the PTRs, make those fixes back in their same baseline to deliver them more robust software. So previously it wasn't possible for us to do this, but that's, uh, that's one of the kind of things that we're doing. A complex slide, which I know you're not going to be able to read at the back, but uh, I'm just going to talk you through it. We employ the agile development method. Uh, people like Eva are helping educate our company about how this should work. We're doing two public releases a year, uh, 3.6, 3.8, and in between that we have internal releases, 3.7, 3.9. So what this means is that we would like your development to be scheduled within our iterations. Uh, within the, each iteration, we have a number of development sprints and a hardening sprint. Uh, it might be hard to see, but at the top line here, we have product management planning. That's our CCBs. We have four CCBs every year, and that's where we prioritize all the work. Development contracts, of course, come first, and then internal projects come, come second. We plan it at the CCB, work starts, uh, and we go through the sprints, the hardening sprint, we conduct regression testing, we integrate the third party software, we do all of the documentation and then we, re we release. And it's a, it's a, it's a circular, circular process in the sense that at any point in time, documentation for the last release is ongoing while they're building the new release. So it's a, it's a very robust method and we've been doing this now for a couple of years and we've got very, very good at this. Uh, and again, we would ask that uh, development work fits into our iteration schedule. Uh, that will just help everybody. It's going to get properly tested. Uh, we don't do the hasties that we used to do many years ago uh, for the US Army with two weeks turnaround. That just leads to buggy software. So we need rigorous processes. BBS now, something like five million lines of code. It is an extremely complex uh, simulation product and we need to be uh, rigorous in our, in our processes. I'll go through some of our contracted work now. So first off, the Swedish Enterprise license had a range of development contracts, uh, associated, or development capabilities associated to it. The main ones were snow simulation, C2 enhancements, and first aid simulation. I'll talk about snow in a bit, but uh, this is just a quick example of what the first aid enhancements look like. Uh, within the editor now, you can do advanced first aid. So we've got a soldier here. We are going to uh, apply a wound amputation of right leg. Uh, this is in the offline mission editor, so now we've, ha we've had a wound applied to this particular soldier. So now we go up to that soldier and we see in the action menu that we can conduct first aid. And we have a new interface, which is going to be hard to see from the back, where you can uh, assess the injury, perform treatment. It's very extendable, so we can add new types of injuries uh, relatively easy. It can be more or less realistic in terms of timings. We can add in, uh, add in uh, faults. So if you make the wrong decision, we can, we can harm the soldier more. And there is a basic simulation, a medical simulation running behind this. BBS is a how to think trainer. It's not about how to apply a tourniquet. It's, it's what do we do given this situation? And so this is yet another example of VBS uh, being applied to another form of how to think training. The second big enhancement uh, for the Swedes were command and control enhancements uh, within VBS. So this allows you to move formations of units very quickly and easily via a single waypoint. Previously, as you might be aware in VBS, you'd have to give every squad a waypoint. Now you can literally build uh, hierarchies of units. So in this case, I've just created a, uh, a squad. I can now create what we're calling a higher echelon group link the squad to the higher echelon, copy and paste, we just created a platoon, create another higher echelon unit, link to higher echelon again, and then we can copy and paste our platoons. And we just created a company. So this is capability that is in 3.6, correct? It's in 3.6. So all I'm doing now is just renaming the, the platoons and companies very quickly. So A company and platoons one, two, and three. You'll see that uh, we can expand and collapse the hierarchy and the editor tree has been uh, improved to support this as well. So it's easy to work with large numbers of units in formation. And 
And then in the C2 system within VBS3, the video is almost over, we can see them moving into a company level formation and we can apply a waypoint to the company commander and the entire formation will move as one uh, towards the waypoint. There's still some work to be done, uh, as I'm sure the Swedes will, will tell you. We're looking at also allowing uh, sub-level waypoints uh, in addition to the, uh, the higher level as well. And that's uh, the C2 enhancements that we made for the Swedes, and it's in uh, the 3.6 baseline. A couple of US Army contracts ongoing. I don't have a lot of detail on these, but I wanted to make you aware. We're working on GFT PTRs. Uh, those are the change requests for the US Army Enterprise License. We're also developing Korean soldier models, uh, both North and South Korea. We're working on CCTT uh, still as well. That's the VBS IG for the Close Combat Tactical Trainer. Uh, we're very well advanced now. We've been working on this for two years. I'll talk about VBS IG in a bit, which is the outcome of that particular contract. Uh, we're finalizing development of 200 models. We've got work scheduled through to 3.9, uh, but uh, I believe that VBS IG will be rolled out on CCTT uh, next year, and that's been going reasonably well but it was not easy. Uh, turning VBS into an IG has been a, a, a long process. Booz Allen have uh, been working with us for a wide range of uh, fairly exciting enhancements. Uh, I've pulled one out here. Uh, the Booz Allen guys are in attendance and they can uh, answer all your questions about uh, the reasons behind this type of development. Uh, being an ex-Signals Corps officer, uh, I thought this was especially interesting. So this is simulation of radio propagation within VBS. Introducing VBS-3's new electronic warfare capabilities. These new capabilities simulate and visualize radio frequency propagation so commanders can learn how to understand and control the virtual electronic spectrum. Simulating wave propagation physics, VBS-3's electronic warfare capabilities realistically approximates line of sight to show how objects such as buildings or landscapes can degrade electronic transmissions. With these new capabilities, VBS-3 simulates transceivers, transmitters, receivers, direction finders, scanners, and jammers. These simulated devices are attachable to any vehicle, unit, or object in VBS-3. Adjust frequencies, volume, antenna type, and more in VBS-3. So you get the idea. It's a, a fantastic enhancement and I, one that I wish that we had when I was a Signal Score officer. I would have actually understood something, uh, potentially. And uh, yeah, we haven't uh, put this into the baseline yet. It's been developed in the United States, but it's not ITAR controlled. Uh, and so we'll work with the US team to see when we can get this technology uh, to you for, uh, for, for broader use outside the US Army. Any questions on that at this point? On the radio stuff? Do you want to add anything, Jim? Okay, cool. We're doing a lot of work for the US Marine Corps. Uh, one of the projects is called uh, the Green Gear Integration. So that's integrating VBS with US Marine Corps command and control systems. And for the Marines, we're working on the squad immersive training environment enhancements. Most of that is now finished. Uh, just get, I've got a couple of screenshots here of, of what we've done. So this screenshot shows an integration between VBS chalkboard and the after action review. Chalkboard allows you to draw, essentially, uh, on the VBS map or on the VBS 3D terrain uh, for, for any purpose. And again, this is another capability that we haven't decided what to do with. Uh, it, it is my intent that it be included in the baseline. Uh, and we just need to formalize that. I'm not allowed to make sweeping statements anymore about what we're going to do. But uh, I'm hoping that you can see this uh, in your versions in the very near future. And the second improvement was Sketchpad. So you can draw a, a diagram freehand, as you can see here in the middle. You can save these, you can share them with other participants on the network to describe a plan, essentially, within VBS in the real-time editor. So that's what we're doing for the US Marine Corps. We've got ongoing work happening for the Dutch. Uh, we're trying to close a couple of uh, long-standing contracts. So NL Orbat and NL Oostorp. Uh, so that's a terrain work and also 3D model work. Uh, we're talking to the Dutch about, well, we actually are contracted to do additional development, some CV-90 uh, fire control system enhancements, similar to what we did for the Challenger 2 for the UK, and also VBS-2 V2.0 Lite. So uh, ongoing work there for the Dutch. 
We're working with an Italian industry customer to do wildfire simulation. And this is another exciting enhancement to the engine. And of course, bushfires are uh, a serious obstacle uh, on the battlefield. And so that's why I approve the work to go ahead. We don't do any work that's not related to the military, generally. Uh, we're very busy. There's a lot of opportunity in the military. We don't go off and, and do first response scenarios. We allow other contractors to do that using VBS. What this is, is an external fire propagation model connected to VBS. What we've done is extended VBS fusion to allow this industry customer to, uh, to essentially simulate fire within VBS. We've allowed, we've created the capability for you to switch tree models, essentially. So you can have a bushfire that's burning in a particular area, and over time, the trees will become more burnt, and you can switch them out. We're building a number of different burnt tree models, as you can see on the bottom there, to support this type of training. We're using our snow layer technology to simulate a layer of ash as well within the, uh, within the, the, the burnt out area. And we're also doing animations of units fighting fires. Uh, so it, I guess as an aside, we have completely updated our pipeline for creating character animations within the game. You might be familiar with a tool called Blender. You can now use Blender through a process to get animations into VBS quite quickly and easily. So we actually have a new uh, lead animator who's been working on this. So this is a list of the internal improvements that I am managing within VBS. So uh, this is what I'm so excited about getting back to next year, is actually managing the, the roadmap, essentially. That's what my number one job within the company is going to be uh, starting in January. So there's a massive list of to-dos uh, that's managed and prioritized by the product management team. Uh, it's myself. Oli and Stephen Jedlicker in the US, we're the product management team within, within Bohemia. So I'm going to read some of the current efforts that are happening right now in 3.7. I'm going to move fairly quickly. Uh, first off, applying Raycast wheels to all vehicles. That will improve the physical simulation of vehicles across uh, the entire VBS uh, range. Sea states and maritime improvements, I'll talk to that. Uh, making sure that all aircraft are simulated using PhysX. Our old physics model is now gone and everything within VBS is simulated using the PhysX, uh, physics model by NVIDIA. Improving the compass readability, adding an undo feature in the mission editor. Uh, it's been a request for about 10 years, uh, and I'm sure it'll be well received. Unit path recording, the ability to uh, record as, from the first person perspective, running around within the virtual battle space, to be able to play that back later during a scenario. So if you're doing a very complex scene, maybe uh, you're shooting an animation, uh, or you're making a complex urban scenario, your administrators can play through from the first person perspective, record each unit's actions, and then play that back using artificially intelligent controlled units. So this allows you to create very complex scenes relatively quickly, and that should be a, a big improvement. We're creating a tiny build of VBS3 with minimal content. Right now, VBS is sitting at about 30 gig. Uh, the tiny build will be tiny, uh, and it will help us uh, with things like IG, where you don't need all of the content that VBS provides. Some of the future efforts, uh, 3.8 or later, uh, action menu rework. The action menu's been there for many years. Uh, it's been, uh, it's a little tricky to use, and it's, it's foreign to most gamers. So we're looking at reworking that. Updating the user interface, overhauling the control scheme. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's been a, a renaissance when it comes to consoles. Most soldiers these days are much more comfortable using a console controller, like an Xbox controller, than they are using keyboard and mouse. So we want to look at potentially making the default control scheme for VBS be an Xbox, Xbox controller rather than the keyboard to speed up that learning time. Uh, so that's something we're going to look at. Uh, upgrading the 3D models, we've started that process already. Uh, 3D models, of course, come with a price. We can make photorealistic 3D models, but how many of them do you want to render at once on the screen? So we, uh, we need to, to tread carefully there, but we're always improving our 3D models. Improving the realism of the Vector 21 and Dagger that's in VBS3 itself. Uh, introduce swapping of gear. Right now within the, uh, the mission editor, there are hundreds, potentially thousands of unit configurations. Uh, a different unit is required for helmet on, helmet off, so on and so forth. So we want you to be able to swap that kind of gear either at runtime or in the editor to make things a little bit easier to use. Uh, do over the video options. At the moment, the video options are a little bit hard to understand and potentially not, 
not as relevant as they once were, so we want to make that easy to use. We want some kind of auto-detect feature for the correct video options uh, when you first install VBS. Supporting SLI, right now VBS does not support SLI and we're looking at that, as well as making many 2D map improvements. Now I can provide a more accurate list uh, if you contact me separately. Uh, it is a long list uh, and I would hope that it's something that the user group could help me with uh, in, uh, in years to come, but I'll talk about that separately. Some additional internal projects. We've got the DK2 in our booth. We've integrated uh, the Oculus DK2 in VBS 3.7, and the demonstration of it is, uh, is on our booth down there. Uh, refactoring the engine source code. Uh, the engine itself is quite complex, and there's an ongoing project to refactor that. Improving all the VBS sounds, implementing DirectX 11 in VBS 3. Uh, we've got a product called Launchpad that we're working on, which is a distribution uh, helper application for rolling out builds across the Battle Simulation Center in a much easier fashion and automatic, automatically downloading new builds from VI Sim, And of course, our localization projects. So we're working on a true French localization of VBS3 right now. So that's French language, uh, French voices, and uh, building up the infrastructure to support easier lo localizations in future. And right on the heels of the French project will be uh, the Spanish language, and more to follow after that. Some key recent enhancements. Uh, you've probably seen this video already. VBS now supports terrains up to 2,000 by 2,000 kilometers in size. Uh, there is a video. Uh, I'll show a little bit of that in a second. But we're demonstrating this on the booth. We had to optimize the way that VBS deals with configurations for large terrains. Uh, previously, it would take about 25 minutes to load a terrain this big. Uh, now it, takes, it can take under 10 seconds to load the terrain. Uh, before it starts queuing up the animations. So it's, uh, it's very quick to load this terrain, and it supports high detailed insets. Now, the only way we could create this terrain was by using TerraTools. And as I go on in my brief, it will become very obvious why VI Sim acquired TerraSim, because they have all the smarts when it comes to dealing with large area terrains, this huge amount of terrain data. I won't let this video, sorry. I won't let this video run in its entirety, but, uh, and, and like I said, we're showing this as a live demo at our booth. But uh, what you're seeing here is the high detailed inset within the broader terrain. It's the East Coast United States. It's a literal environment, so it has all the coastlines and, and the major rivers on the side. Uh, you can, it, it supports all the features of VBS. So all the features of VBS within one really massive terrain area. In fact, in the interest of time, I'm not going to let the video run all the way through. If you're interested in this, please come to our booth. Uh, and uh, it's, quite a, it's quite a feat to see this in the current version of VBS. Maritime enhancements. So VBS now supports sea states 0 through 10. I should say VBS 3.8 will support sea states 0 through 10 with variable opacity and water color. Uh, we're working with PhysX to simulate the ships on the maritime environment at a high level of uh, realism. We're doing scripted particle effects, we're doing ship wakes, and we're doing a wide range of buoys. So this is on display at our booth, and of course I have a video. I'm not sure if uh, you've all seen this. Uh, this is just the very beginning. This is the first prototype, uh, and we've already achieved quite a high level of visual realism within the sea states. Snow simulation. Apparently it snows a lot in Sweden, and they uh, requested a quite realistic simulation of snow within VBS. This has been completed in VBS 3.6. Uh, we have a snow layer that can be changed on the fly. Vehicles will get bogged in the snow layer and infantry soldiers will slow down when they're walking through deep snow. And artificially intelligent units will actually choose the easy path through the snow. We've done a simulation of snow compression. So if a tank drives across the snow and the snow gets compressed, then it's going to be easier to walk across than if it was just fresh snow. Uh, it's again on our booth, it's working right now. Um, Jimmy uh, took a, a video of, uh, of our demo at the booth just, uh, just this morning. So this is what's running at our booth here. This is about a metre and a half of snow. As you can see, the snow is built up uh, over the top of this vehicle. We're going to get into the vehicle. The soldier can't run, by the way, and the soldier is sinking in the snow. Now that we're in the vehicle, the vehicle is not going to move because it's, it's, it's buried in snow. We can plough the roads. So road ploughing can be on or off. So the roads have now been ploughed. 
The snow has been built up to the sides of the roads and all of this is happening procedurally. This is a desert terrain. And if you visit our booth, you'll see uh, the guys and girls there can turn the snow on or off with a simple script command. This is uh, an Afghan terrain. You'll see that the buildings have snow caps. So we support uh, snow caps on buildings. The snow caps on buildings aren't procedural. Uh, we had to run an offline process to define where on the buildings snow will sit. Uh, it's just a little too complex to do that at runtime. But all of the snow that you see on the ground is being applied at runtime through our biotope technology. So we're driving along uh, down the ploughed road. If we were to drive off the road, we would become bogged. What you can see ahead is a river. That river is presently impassable because it is, it is water. Uh, again, we can freeze over water, uh, well, in this case with a simple script command. That water has now become ice, and the snow will again build up on the ice. And we can cross that, uh, what was previously a water feature. I'm just going to let this run for another 20 seconds or so. So pretty soon we're going to come up to a tracked vehicle. Now tracked vehicles uh, can push through deep snow, unlike wheeled vehicles. And how effective each vehicle is at pushing through snow can be defined on a per vehicle basis. So we've jumped out of our UN vehicle now and we're going to race over to the tracked vehicle after looking at the beautiful scenery. Thanks, Jimmy. So we've entered the tracked vehicle and the tracked vehicle can push through the deep snow. And it might be a bit difficult to see, but the snow behind the tracked vehicle is being compressed into a trench. And we can conduct vehicle recovery. That's what we can see here is a, is, is a bogged vehicle. And using a tracked vehicle, we can do vehicle recovery using the default uh, VBS controls. And so it's obvious to see where we can take this tech. You know, deep sand, sand dunes, mud, layers of ash. Uh, now we've got this material texture uh, and this, uh, this, this snow layer technology, we can do a lot with it. And we're quite excited to see, uh, to see what we can do now. And you can just see over here on the left uh, where we, we dug a trench when we drove the tracked vehicle through the first time. Are there any questions on the snow technology? Like I said, it's available now, it works very well, and it's in, uh, in 3.6. We support some very high fidelity 3D models now in VBS3. Uh, these are some uh, demonstrations that the, the guys have created in Prague. So this is a Bushmaster, the real vehicle contrasted with the in-game vehicle, and also a US Army helicopter pilot at very high fidelity uh, within the VBS3 engine. So if you have a, a requirement for photorealistic models, VBS can support that now. We're also improving the character head rig. This is an ongoing process. Uh, the new head rig provides many more bones, and we are doing further work to introduce things like face facial mimics, blending mimics, uh, supporting idle animations and improving blinking, and generally making the character modeling within VBS more accurate. I'm going to talk about some new products now. Uh, the first one's VBS IG. So this is the result of our work uh, for the, the US Army with regards to CCTT. It's a version of VBS that you can use as an image generator. I'm going to skip forward one slide. This is what's running at our booth right now. What you have is three channels of the VBS IG. Each channel is running at 60 frames per second in a default VBS terrain. So we haven't, we haven't uh, reduced the fidelity of the 3D models in that terrain. What we've done is spent about 18 months optimizing the VBS engine. And uh, Vladimir, who's actually our, put your hand up Vladimir, he's our, <laughs> our, uh, our engine architect was responsible for this. Uh, he's been involved with our game engine now for many years, uh, far longer than myself or Mark. And he was leading the charge to optimize the engine for this kind of usage. The CCTT had some very demanding requirements, uh, view distances of, uh, of 100 kilometers, uh, object draw distances of 7 kilometers, and support for 500 entities minimum running at 60 frames per second. So we have to optimize the engine to a significant degree to support its use as an IG. Uh, you can connect the VBS IG to either the VBS IG host, so that's a version of VBS that's talking SIGI, or you can connect it to a legacy host, like we did in CCTT. You can connect, if you're using the VBS3 host, you can connect normal VBS clients to that host. 
So it's very easy, trivial, to connect classroom trainers uh, to simulators running the VBS IG. So this is in the final stages of productization. It's available uh, early next year. We expect by March. And uh, contact us uh, if you would like to know more about the VBS IG. And the last thing I'll say, what you see at the very bottom there is VBS running on a, a Surface tablet. So VBS will run on some of these new tablets that are, that are being uh, created. That's actually a UAV feed uh, connected to the VBS IG. Any questions on VBS IG or its capability? It's on, it's on display at our booth uh, and, and come and have a look. I'm not going to show the whole video. This is a VBS IG video. Uh, it's on our website. Uh, it just shows uh, VBS running on a, a number of different image generators and talks about the technology. OK, so we're moving towards the end of my presentation now. Uh, I just want to quickly talk about the 2015 roadmap. Uh, I can't go into too much detail about our upcoming development contracts, but uh, the US, Sweden, and France are all talking to us about development contracts. Uh, and I would ask you, uh, talk to the Swedes, they're right here. Uh, if you're interested in, in knowing what they might contract, uh, I'm sure that they can give you some information. I've talked about major internal projects in 2015. We are taking VBS into the maritime and air domains uh, very rapidly. We're relaunching VBSDN. We're hiring additional support engineers. We're continuing, continuing to open up the VBS product. So the military user group, why do we have a military user group? To share VBS3 content, to allow you to influence the VBS3 roadmap and ensure VICM is not paid twice for the same thing. Many years ago, uh, a gentleman by the name of Tom Mowat, who's sitting at the back of the room, used to chair the military user group. Tom then got deployed. And uh, ever since, I have been performing that role. But that's not necessarily healthy for a product like VBS. I have my own agenda. And I think it would be much more healthy for this user group if it's chaired by a military person. So I've been talking to the Dutch, who haven't committed to anything, uh, about the idea of a true military user group chaired by the military that would convene outside of ITEC or ITSEC. Now, this, this one and a half hours is not enough time to really accomplish much. So this would be a one day, two day, three day event in which military user, users uh, would meet, probably somewhere in Europe, uh, to discuss VBS with or without VICIM. You know, I get invited as a guest. And this, I think, would be a lot more healthy for this product. You can talk uh, about the contracts you're willing to put forward, make sure you're not contracting us for the same thing, and uh, generally collaborate. So that's something I'm talking about initially with the Dutch, and uh, more to follow, I suppose, on what we're doing with the, the, the military user group uh, in the future. At this point, I want to hand over to Paul, who's going to talk quickly about VBS NATO. Thank you. Thank you. So a couple of years ago, the NATO Secretary General started a new initiative called Smart Defense. And uh, not that we've been doing stupid defense before that, but this is a new idea, new buzzword. That tried to get nations to work together. So if someone's developing something and another nation's looking to develop something, why should they reinvent the wheel? So the idea behind Smart Defense was multiple areas, of one of which was in trying to deploy uh, educational training and better use of simulation. That was followed by the Connected Forces Initiative, which encourages NATO to have more exercises, better use of technology, and more involvement with the partners. So one of those initiatives coming out of that is a smart defense initiative called uh, Immersive Training Environments. Uh, for the last couple of years, the United Kingdom took on the lead role for that, and NATO is supporting the United Kingdom. So what we've done, we used to have VBS2 Lite, and we would give that away to any NATO nation or any partner nation for them to look into what is VBS, will it work for us, and then try and connect us all together to do distributed training. The limitations of VBS2 light were too much and we couldn't really use it the way we wanted to. So this September we started a new initiative where we bought 50 VBS3 full licenses and we loaned them to you as a nation, as a partner nation, or as an entity within a nation to experiment with, to test with, to try and collaborate with other nations or collaborate with us and for a period of four to six weeks or whatever, you get a full license, you get BI support in delivering it, configuring it, using it, and then at the end of that, you give us back the license and you share with us what you did and uh, how you used it, and hopefully as a continuum, as a consortium, we can work better ways to go together. Linking to that will then be a database where you can go to and pull down scenarios from other people that have done stuff, 
and I was talking this morning, if you could go in and there's a whole menu of different scenarios to fit your goal, you can plug that in, use that as a template, and then build your own one, and then hopefully put yours back into this shared library. On top of that would be assets, so if you developed assets, you can put them into the shared library, and as well as any data terrain or any special uh, exercise terrain you've created. So we're trying to create two things really, a distributed training environment where we learn together, for coalition training within NATO, you can practice prior to deployment, you can work with your coalition uh, troops, you can share ideas, you can train together, and then when you go to the actual exercise or the deployment or the operation, you're far more effective on the first day. And second to that is this database of uh, equipment, assets, tools, terrain, whatever, where we can share ideas, blogs, community, and that I think will link into the user group as well, that it will be the driving force to sort of, to make us all work together and to share. So I have uh, some trifolds uh, down here if you'd like to get involved. We haven't been overutilized at the moment, we just started, so we have a lot of licenses available till next September. So please come and talk to me if you're interested. Thank you, Pete. Okay. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to, uh, you've been very patient. I'm gonna ask you to sit through one more presentation. And this is the Terrasim presentation. I'm gonna ask the Terrasim guys to come up, please. Don't worry, you don't need to speak. I'll do all the talking. But uh, I just want uh, everyone here to be aware of who they are. So we have the who's who of Terrasim here. Earl, who I introduced. Dan, who's one of the lead developers, and Charles. So these guys from Terrasim um, are obviously responsible for TerraTools and associated source data preparation products. Uh, and I just wanted to, to point out that they're still a separate company. We've kept, we've kept Terrasim as a separate uh, business unit, essentially. Uh, they uh, continue, just like BICM, to be neutral in the marketplace. They continue to support many different runtime formats. Uh, that includes other game engines. And we're quite proud of what they've been able to achieve. Uh, so, so thanks, guys. You, you can take a seat. Um, I just wanted to introduce you quickly. Uh, I'm just going to present some of their slides now. And uh, now, I'm not from Terrasim, but I'm going to do my best. And Earl, you're going to get up and shout at me if I say anything wrong. Uh, this is a relatively short presentation, but uh, and then I'm going to let you guys go if, if there's no uh, further discussion. So first off, the big news about what TerraSim is showcasing at IHSEC, uh, TerraTools 5 and Extract 2.1. So TerraTools 5 is the tool that's been used to create the ECGT terrain. If you want to create massive terrain areas for VBS3 or any other uh, runtime, then the TerraTools Batch Mode Manager will, uh, will help you do that with interior generation uh, as well. So that's, uh, that's, that's buildings and the like. Extract 2.1 uh, is also been released, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and Material Map. Uh, material Map is the application that allows you to quickly create surface materials for VBS or other runtimes in an automatic manner. So rather than saying this is pine forest, this is grass, Material Map will look at a satellite texture and conduct that process for you. So TerraTools 5, we talked about Batch Mode Manager. Uh, I'm going to just bump across one more to show you this. So it, it will move through a, a terrain tile by tile and conduct that procedural generation for you uh, for your offline terrain database. It also creates enterable buildings. So uh, this picture here, uh, which for some reason says O, is that intentional? Uh, on, on, the, on the left, you can see what the shape files look like. These were the building footprints and then uh, the TerraTools product and Batch Road Manager can automatically create enterable buildings, and these can be quite complex and multi-story. So here is our OH. Uh, as you can see, complex multi-story buildings, including underground areas, uh, which is fully supported by VBS. That's what TerraTools can do. Uh, and this contrasts a first floor bl blueprint with what's been procedurally created. Is that correct? Um. Yep, so that's actually the, the blueprint tool for, for oh, okay. manually creating high detail interior space. Then I was not correct at all. Thank you, Will. <laughs> uh, and yes, this will be the final building model, correct? Yep, and soon to support uh, procedural destruction. Okay, cool. Soon to support procedural destruction as well. And the final P3D model within VBS. So I'm moving very quickly through these slides. So here we have uh, Material Map. So Material Map, like I said, automatically classifies the surfaces of landscapes. Uh, so you can get the correct, correct biotopes, for example, within uh, runtimes like VBS. And that's on display at the booth. 
TerraTools now supports extended surfaces and biotopes. This is the Colorado terrain. That's what we're looking at here. And so this is a biotope. You've probably heard me talk before about biotopes, residual biotopes. The East Coast gaming terrain, 2,000 by 2,000 kilometers, billions of trees, far too many to store uh, the individual positions of. So we need to use biotopes. Uh, and TerraTools fully supports that now. So Extract is a tool, it's a source data prep tool that allows you to extract geospatial source data from legacy terrain databases, supporting those very various formats. Uh, and we also are currently working on a project, project to export from the VBS format. Uh, and you should contact us if you're interested in that, if you've got a VBS terrain that you would like to correlate with other simulations, then come and talk to us. Uh, we are um, looking at doing that right now. So you can see what's new in Extract 2.1, support for OTF-8, extended open scene graph support, uh, and bug fixes. I'm going to move through this pretty quick. I spoke about Material Map. Uh, you guys are demonstrating Material Map at the booth. And like I said, it is a necessary tool if you're creating big VBS terrains, because it creates the surfaces automatically. Now supports vector feature data, uh, image classification remapping, VBS3 extended surfaces. VBS3 used to support only six surface types, and now we support 256 surface types. And it's easy to use. Can you talk to this, please? Yeah. yeah, so this is basically, when you use material map, there are times where it gets confused about what it's, what it's seeing. So it's maybe matching some dark patches on the runway um, with something that it detected as forest. But if we have the shape files that describe this air, airfield already, um, we can basically import um, a shape file that says that basically we can uh, prevent material map from trying to reclassify this data. So we can just say, we know this is uh, tarmac, so just uh, skip the classification on this. Um, and then there's actually a few more levels of sophistication of what we can do with that. So that's going to be in material map uh, 1.2, which is coming out in a few weeks, I think. Cool. Uh, for the end of the year, anyway. OK, cool. Thank you very much. And to finish up, here is the product roadmap. And uh, I guess I'll finish by saying that we have TerraSim representatives at our CCBs and VISIM representatives at the TerraSim CCBs. So we work together on almost everything these days to make sure we, uh, we have synergy. So at our booth, we're doing demonstrations of all the improvements I've spoken about. Uh, all, everything I talk about is real. So the IG is real, the ECGT terrain is real, um, and uh, you know, biotopes and so on. And we're demonstrating all of that at our booth if you're interested. Uh, demonstrations of all the TerraSim software. We have booth partners. So booth partners are very important for us. Uh, this is essentially small companies that are taking VBS and, uh, and leveraging VBS. So uh, I'd really appreciate it if you could support them and look at their demonstrations. OK, so we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for attendance. And please visit our booth. Cheers.